which serial killer had almost 100 victims, who was caught trying to flee the country, and who was arrested nearly 40 years after their killing spree. Keep watching for all the details. Lonnie Franklin earned his name the Grim Sleeper because authorities believed he went into a deep hibernation between his grisly killing streaks. After a string of murders in the 1980s, the killer re-emerged to stalk the streets of Los Angeles once again at the turn of the century. To the authorities' knowledge, the Grim Sleeper had a relatively small number of victims that were spaced years apart and a long break between 1988 and 2002. But by the time Franklin was finally caught in 2010, his victim count was higher than anyone imagined. In all, the Grim Sleeper was charged with the murders of 10 women, and the real number of victims may have been even higher than that. When he was apprehended, more than 1,000 photos and hundreds of hours of video were found in the killer's possession, showing unknown women who may well have also been his victims. It's possible that Franklin killed more than 25 women, potentially leaving 15 unaccounted for in Southern California. In cases like these, the authorities tend to continue trying to identify victims long after the killer has been convicted, so the families of those victims can have some closure. With Franklin already sentenced to the death penalty in 2016, there really wasn't much more that the justice system could legally do to him. Before his sentence could be carried out, Franklin died in his cell in March of 2020. It's a relief to know that he's that he's gone and that the victims' families that are still alive were able to see an end to that. Elias Abulazam had an unusually literal nickname a serial stabber. His crime spanned from Michigan through Ohio and all the way to Virginia, with the majority having been committed in Flint, Michigan. He hurt a lot of families. He hurt a lot of lives, a lot of homes. He ruined a lot of people's lives, period. It's thought that Abulazam may have stabbed up to 20 victims, with at least five having died as a result. Most of the killer's victims were black men, either by design or coincidence, suggesting his senseless violence could have been racially motivated. The killer's run spanned four months over the summer of 2010 before he was arrested and convicted. The police caught up to Abulazam at an airport in Atlanta where he was attempting to flee the country for Israel. It took two years to convict Abulazam of the murders. He was sentenced to life in prison. Anthony Sowell, the Cleveland Strangler, had a pretty straightforward MO. He strangled his victims in Cleveland, Ohio. But it wasn't the killings that put him on the police's radar, but rather a different violent crime that followed him throughout his life and blew the Cleveland Strangler case wide open. It all started in 1989, when Sowell was found guilty of assaulting a woman and sentenced to serve 15 years. He was paroled early, but came under suspicion of sexual assault several times after his release. Being a sex offender meant that authorities could pay Sowell a surprise visit anytime they pleased, and that's what happened in 2009. For years, there had been complaints about foul odors emanating from somewhere near Sowell's home, but the dots hadn't been connected until the day of that surprise visit. Girls had also been found strangled in the area as far back as 1988. But on that fateful day, Sowell assaulted another woman and earned himself another arrest. When the police searched his home, they found the decomposing bodies of several victims on his property. The Cleveland Strangler killed at least 11 women during his run, and though he wasn't initially arrested in the past 10 years, he was convicted for those killings in 2011, and he was also sentenced to death. The penalty couldn't be upheld, though, since Sowell died in prison in February 2021. Salvatore Peron, the son of Sal, as he's been ironically named, is a serial killer who targeted Middle Eastern shopkeepers in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Bay Ridge. In 2012, Perone gunned down three shopkeepers in the area in seemingly random attacks. Perone's killings were cold-blooded. He walked into each of the shops and opened fire with a sawed-off 22 caliber rifle. Perone was arrested the same year as the killings after the authorities found a duffel bag containing his rifle and three knives covered with traces of what looked like blood in his girlfriend's apartment. The killer was sentenced to life in prison. No serial killer is known to have accumulated a body count in the United States as high as that of Samuel Little. That's not just speculation either. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has confirmed that Little is the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. Little gained his title by murdering those he thought would never be accounted for, and he nearly got away with it too. The killer's murder spree began in 1970 and ended in 2005, though Little wasn't convicted of his crimes until 2014 and it took another four years for him to confess. And it was a confession of mind-blowing scope. What city did you kill the most in? Miami and Los Angeles. And how many did you kill in Los Angeles? Los Angeles, uh, approximately 20. Little has stated that he strangled 93 victims during his serial killing career, and so far, at least 50 of his confessed crimes have been confirmed. 
Those 50 plus victims make Ted Bundy's 33 and John Wayne Gacy's 36 look measly in comparison. Along with his detailed confession, Little was kind enough to provide investigators with detailed sketches of the people that he killed, which the authorities are still trying to match to the identities of known victims. Little truly lived a life of crime, surviving on what he could steal and drifting the country until he was put behind bars. He died in prison in December 2020. The first rule in the serial killer's handbook is to not get caught. It takes a lot of foresight and preparation, of which Israel Keyes had plenty. Keyes was one of the most methodical serial killers in American history, killing between 8 and 12 people before he broke his own rules and got caught, bringing his murder spree to an end in 2012. Careful to avoid capture, Keyes refused to kill in his own backyard. Instead, he would fly around the country to remote locations and then rent a car to drive up to hundreds of more miles before finally targeting the victim. He would also leave kill kits around the country months or years in advance to help limit his exposure around the time of the actual murder. His kills would then happen in remote areas or houses with attached garages, so there would be no witnesses to catch him in the act. Keyes was only caught because he killed a victim close to home and used her debit card to make a purchase. To this day, the FBI is still trying to track down all of his potential kills. Before Cleveland's Michael Madison turned to serial killing, his violent sexual impulses had already landed him a four-year prison sentence in 2002 for attempted sexual assault. But his admiration for a fellow Cleveland criminal, the Cleveland Strangler, may have influenced him to become a killer himself. Over the course of less than a year, between 2012 and 2013, Madison killed three people, luring them back to his home before he strangled them to death. He kept the bodies close by, stashing one victim in his garage, another in a bush, and the final victim in the basement of an empty house. In these locations, Madison could view all of the bodies from the second-story balcony of his home anytime he wished. A jury found Madison guilty of his crimes in 2019. He was given the death penalty. As his name suggests, Darren Dion Van operated in Gary, Indiana, killing at least seven people over roughly a one-year period before being arrested in October 2014. When Van was questioned after being taken into custody, he admitted that he killed one woman for a few hundred bucks and some cocaine. Another, he said he killed simply because he was angry. Van also sent the police on something of a grim scavenger hunt, revealing that he had hidden bodies of victims within abandoned houses throughout the city. The uh, individual that committed these crimes, he, seeing his MO was to put uh, people in the abandoned, uh, these dead women in abandoned houses. In 2018, Van's case would finally come to an end due to a plea deal he struck with prosecutors for life in prison in order to avoid the death penalty. A 911 call in the middle of the night from a kidnapping victim brought the police to the door of Sean Great, whom they would soon discover was a serial killer. But when Great was arrested in 2016 for the murder of two women, nobody could have guessed how deep this rabbit hole would go. It turned out that Great had been murdering for a lot longer than anyone originally suspected, and it didn't take long for the killer's two murder charges to turn into five. His first kill took place in 2006. He managed to trick his girlfriend at the time into unwittingly cleaning up the woman's blood, later proposing marriage to her with the ring off the victim's finger. Great would receive the death penalty for his crimes, upheld in a 2020 appeal, which the county prosecutor of the case thought was fitting. As county prosecutor Christopher Tunnell told the judge in the case, quote, he is the reason the death penalty exists in the state of Ohio. William Devin Howell was already serving a 15-year term for manslaughter when he was charged with the murders of six other people, whom he killed in 2003. In 2017, Howell pled guilty to the charges and received six consecutive life sentences on top of the time he was already serving. The killer spoke with the author Ann Howard and spilled all of his dark, disturbing secrets before his conviction. According to Howell, he didn't murder for the sake of murder. To him, it was all about the assault. Killing was just a way to get rid of the evidence don't fit the mold at, at all that everybody tries to put serial killers in, you know what I mean? So why I grew up to commit these crimes, I have no idea. After each killing, Howell would dump the bodies in a swamp behind the local strip mall, which he referred to as his garden. The term became the title of Ann Howard's book, His Garden, Conversations with a Serial Killer. A former police officer by the name of Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested in 2018 for being the infamous Golden State Killer proving that serial killers can truly be hiding behind any corner or within any face. D'Angelo's arrest, however, took one of the most infamous serial killers of the past century off the streets and put to bed a case that had gone unsolved for 40 years. With a professional history as a police officer, D'Angelo committed a string of at least 12 murders and more than 50 assaults in a period that spanned through the 70s and 80s. The spree poisoned the hearts of California residents with heavy feelings of paranoid fear from years 
first as the East Area Rapist, then as the original Night Stalker, before settling into his final title as the Golden State Killer. Whatever name D'Angelo's serial killer persona went by didn't matter. He was sentenced to more than 20 life sentences for his terrible deeds regardless, and it only took a covert investigation, DNA evidence, and the better part of half a century to do it. The Los Angeles Times details the investigation that led to D'Angelo's arrest, noting that the investigators used two for-profit genetic genealogy companies to match bodily fluid from a rape kit in the case to some of D'Angelo's family members. Once identified, the killer confessed to 26 total kidnappings and murders, as well as more than 60 other violent crimes, closing a case that seemed virtually unsolvable. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about true crime are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.